morning. Welcome to Twin Oaks Presbyterian Church. My name is Russ. It's a pleasure to welcome you. If I have not met you, you have not met me, please come find me after the service of worship. I'm usually mingling somewhere right down here, maybe somewhere back there. It would be my pleasure to meet you and to welcome you to our fellowship. A couple of announcements that are important to the life of our body. You know that uh, today, after the service of worship, there is a, a luncheon for the Golden Oaks. The Golden Oaks is our 55 and older ministry. You should have signed up for it, but if you didn't sign up for it, you're still welcome. You would exit the sanctuary after the service of worship and hang a right until you run into a group of august, mature, thoughtful saints led by that man right there. And they would direct you uh, to the luncheon. Also, there is a blood drive happening here tomorrow. You need to sign up for it. The information is in your bulletin. You can sign up to, uh, to donate blood. Tuesday, David and 11 middle schoolers. And three other adults. David and three other adults along with 11 middle schoolers are piling together to drive to Texas. And you know who you ought to be praying for on Tuesday. <laughs> because for many of you, you're probably like me, the idea of piling into a van with 11 middle schoolers and the idea of purgatory sound a lot like, <laughs> a lot like one another. So in all seriousness, it's a fantastic opportunity for young people to learn about the Lord. Real opportunity to learn about the Lord, to be taught from the scriptures uh, in a context with other with other students and begin to make that faith of their parents their own. So please be praying. Also, Wednesday, if you're interested in learning about how you as a Christian can minister to those who are involved in Christian science, it's going to be an opportunity this, this Wednesday evening uh, for a, a chance to learn about Christian science. There's a large community of Christian scientists in St. Louis, and if you want to learn how to engage that community with the gospel of Jesus, the information, again, is in, your, is in your bulletin. There are job openings at Twin Oaks Christian School for a fifth grade teacher, a kindergarten aide, a before care worker. If, if you're interested in filling any of those or you know someone who is, then please contact the school office. And even if you don't know who might check any of those boxes, please be in prayer that God would provide the right people for the school. We're also, again, this year going to participate in a, the adopt a teacher or staff member at the school. And so it doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of money. But if you want to support the work of Christian education that takes place in this building, uh, contact the, the school office and you can be put in touch with, with how you or your family can adopt one of the teachers or staff members. And again, all of this information is on page, pages 13, or 11 through 13 in, in your bulletin. There's one announcement that you need to know about that, that isn't in your bulletin, and that is that the memorial service for our brother Jerry Truax will be this coming Saturday morning here at 11 a.m. This coming Saturday morning here at 11 a.m. And you'll note in the bulletin also that the following Saturday morning here at 11 a.m. we'll have the service uh, for Jay, ne Jay Nichols and a service for um, Barbara Watson will be held at the same time at Chesterfield Presbyterian Church. But this coming Saturday morning will be the service for Jerry Truax. And before we enter into God's presence in worship, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Josh Baker to come forward and talk to us about a ministry called Awana. Good morning. In 2005, the National Study on Youth and Religion released a finding that said that the majority of American teenagers are incredibly inarticulate about their faith. And that may not surprise you. It didn't particularly surprise me. But what got my attention was this. It didn't say that American teenagers didn't have faith but it said they hadn't been equipped and prepared to articulate their faith, to explain what they believed and why they believed it. As Christian parents, it's our desire that our kids would be, as Peter said, ready always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that lies within them. We want them to be, as we studied this summer, like Timothy, who from childhood knew the sacred writings, which were able to make him wise into salvation because of the ministry of his uh, grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. How do we lay the foundation for our kids? Awana is one of the ways in which we lay that foundation. If your family is anything like mine, you may have great aspirations and desires for your kids. You may even execute the teaching and training of your children fairly well from time to time, but 
I struggle with consistency. It can go days or even weeks sometimes without family devotions being consistent in the way that they need to be, whether it's soccer schedules or volleyball or music lessons or work schedules or academics and homework. Those things too easily distract us. For our family, Awana is one of the ways in which we can be consistent. Every Wednesday, even if we come to Wednesday morning and say, Dad, I don't know my verses. Well, we study them on Wednesdays, if nothing else, right? Awana is a ministry taken from 2 Timothy 2.15, which challenges us to study, to work hard, to do our best, to show ourselves A-W-A-N-A, -A, because approved workers are not ashamed. As we raise the foundation or lay the foundation for our kids to know scripture from an early age, we prepare them that they might be approved workers and not ashamed in handling scripture. To the children and young adults, we challenge you to lay the foundation now. Those verses that you've memorized now and engrafted into your hearts will be with you. The Lord will bring that back to you later in life. He will bear much fruit through you in that. Parents, obviously we bear the burden at home to raise our kids in a the traditions of scripture and a relationship with Christ, but together, we come together, we bear those burdens one another to teach our kids about Christ. In the middle of the week, we take aside time from our busy schedules and say, this is important. We're going to take time on Wednesday nights to spend 90 minutes playing games, but also studying scripture and memorizing God's word and just being there to show our kids that this is important. Um, grandparents and single adults, you may not know what an influence you have on our kids. If you are able to be there on Wednesday nights, we would love to have you. They love having you around, and you make a great impact on their lives. As a church family as a whole, we have the opportunity, we have the responsibility to lay that foundation for our kids, that they might know God's word and not be inarticulate about their faith, but they might be articulate explainers and communicators about Jesus, about the truths of Scripture. And Awana is one of the ways in which we as a church community can do that. So I urge you to join us. We start up this fall on September 7th. We'll have training before that. If you'd love to, like to join us as a helper or a, an assistant or a, a, leading a classroom, we have several openings still for this fall. Um, or if you just want to come be there and sit in the classroom and be a friend to these kids and show them that the parents of their friends think this is important too, or the grandparents of their friends think that this is important. I know in my own life, I have a, a, the dad of one of my good friends, he taught a Bible study every week for us, and I don't remember much of what he said, but I know that he showed up every week because it was important, and that made an impact on my life. So just come. Be there for our kids. I appreciate it. Our kids have been extremely blessed through the teachings that so many of you have invested already through Awana and VBS and Sunday School. Um, if you'd like to be participating, there is information on the website at twinoakschurch.org forward slash Awana. There is information in the bulletin, or reach out to myself or Carol Scanio after the service. We'd love to have you. Thank you. And so now as we prepare to worship our God together, listen for how it's true, and you know this, that it is grace. It's God's grace that equips us to serve him and to live in the fear of the Lord.
our call to worship. And the very last word of our call to worship is this, servants. I suspect if you took an impromptu poll at West County Mall, that word would not have a very positive reception to it. Because many of us are familiar with the abuse of power. Someone who is a master or a ruler can oftentimes abuse their servants. But I want you to listen to the words from Psalm 135 that speak of the master. He is good. By his grace, he has chosen a people. He is great. He will vindicate his people. And he will have compassion on his servants. And so it is that master, that God, our heavenly father, who calls us to worship this morning as his servants. So please stand as we use Psalm 135 for our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on the servants. You servants, you serve a wonderful master. Please continue standing as we sing hymn number 12, Exalt the Lord, His Praise Proclaim.
God and Father, we stand here in the house of the Lord, in your house, and praise you for indeed you are a good master. Indeed, by grace you have chosen a people for yourself. Great are your works. Indeed, Father, you will vindicate your people and you will have compassion on your servants. So this morning as we come to worship you, would you give us great joy in worshiping you, our master, through Jesus, our high priest. In his name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Paul compares and contrasts the works of the flesh with the works of the spirit. In other words, those things that come naturally to us over against those things that the Holy Spirit works in our character. And you know that each of us, even as believers, we're works in progress. And so there remains in us corruption in the flesh. And even though we've been saved and even though we are being sanctified, so often we're living according to those works of the flesh. And so I want to remind you what Paul says about them from Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's interesting that Paul lists 15 different things, 15 things. And when you think of the works of the flesh, I, I tend to think of this. Well, I think of sexual immorality, or I think of idolatry, or I think of drunkenness. And yes, those things are listed, but eight of the 15, eight of them fully, more than half, list list ways in which you and I refuse to play well with others. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. These all speak to our divisive attitudes. They speak to your selfishness and mind. They speak to the fact that so often we are argumentative. We're just quarrelsome. And so if you recognize that there's a, a, a part of you that remains this way, then this is the time to come to God in our service of worship to confess your sin, to confess even the ways in which you can be abrasive, in which I can be difficult to get along with, in which I make it harder to get along with you rather than easier. So let's turn to our God in a time of confession of sin, confessing that these things remain in our hearts and asking him to help you to kill your sin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we confess that these traits of quarrelsomeness, of being disagreeable, of tending toward divisiveness, of not controlling the way that we speak well, these things reside in each of us, and so often, so frequently, they rear their ugly heads in us. And so, Father, help us to take this first step of owning it and saying, yes, that is and can be me. Father, we turn away from these, we repent of them and trust in Christ, and we ask that you would forgive us, and we ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, would continue that work in driving these traits out of us, in killing the natural man, in, in putting aside the works of the flesh, and instead inculcating in us the works of the Spirit. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Paul continues and says in Galatians 5, 22 through 24, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so the Holy Spirit who dwells within you by Christ is about the business of producing Christ-like traits within you even as He is killing those sinful traits. And so if you are in Christ this morning, then I want you to know, firstly, you are forgiven. And I want to encourage you, secondly, that the Holy Spirit is working. He is ever working in you to conform you into the image of Him who saved you, that you might be as lovely as Christ is lovely. That's worth singing about. So will you stand with me and sing Holy Spirit? It's printed on page four in your bulletin. remain standing as we confess our faith together. And in case you were wondering why, why is it that we always confess our faith after we confess our sin? Because it is the pattern of the gospel. As we confess our sin and we receive forgiveness in Christ, as we receive His Holy Spirit, then we can approach the Word of God and it can speak to us, not as a law that condemns us because you have been forgiven and set free in Christ, but as instruction that exhorts and encourages you and teaches you to the way to show God your gratitude for having been set free. And so, as we confess together, we're going to receive God's instructions even about how to argue if arguing is necessary. And as we read, ask the Holy Spirit to grant you eyes to see and faith to practice. My son, be attentive to my wisdom Incline your ear to my understanding. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. You 
you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have, because you do not ask. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And turn the page as we sing together from page six, Gracious Spirit, dwell with me. As the ushers come down, please remember to fill out the tear-off card on the back of your bulletin. Um, in addition to letting us know how you can connect with us, um, you can also record your prayer requests on the back of that card. We pray for those prayer requests by name every Tuesday at our Tuesday staff meetings. As we come to prayer, we invoke God's help. Psalm 86, 4, the psalmist says, gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, do I lift my soul. Will you please join me in prayer? Gracious Father, we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for you planned our adoption before the creation of the world. You purchased our redemption through Jesus' perfect and righteous life, and you provided us your Holy Spirit to dwell within us, who empowers fruitful living in this life and guarantees the completion of that work till Christ returns. We praise you, Father, that in your great love, you correct us with the truth. You did not leave us to our sinful ways, but in your mercy and kindness, you have corrected us and are correcting us. You did this not only in word, but also in deed, in the person and life of Jesus, the only one who lived perfectly, obeying your ways and walking in the truth. Thank you that your correction is a grace to us. Lord, we thank you for a great inquirer's class this past weekend. We thank you, Jesus, um, that you loved your church by humbly laying down your life for it. We ask that you would empower us to do the same for one another. Specifically, Lord, we want to lift up our church member of the day, Ruth Sprague, to you. Thank you 
for your great love for Ruth. Would you remind her of her how precious she is in your sight? And we pray that you would bless her and make her a blessing at Mason Point Senior Living Community. Father, we pray also for the Truax family, specifically for Barbara and her children, as they mourn the passing of their father, Jerry. Give them your peace and comfort by your Holy Spirit, as he is now absent from the body, but present with the Lord. Thank you for the privilege and joy that many in this church have had in knowing Jerry and the life he lived. Help his family and loved ones as they remember and celebrate his legacy. Give them hope in the resurrection and in knowing the truth that, that nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, we continue to pray for the people of Ukraine, for the many men, women, and children, and families who have been tragically displaced from their homes, separated from loved ones due to this war. We pray, Lord, that your gospel would go forth in that nation, bringing life out of death and bringing many into your kingdom as a result. Lord, we also pray for our congregation. Thank you for a great VBS a couple weeks ago that the children were taught to boldly praise the name of Jesus and to not be afraid to share the good news of him with others. We ask you to continue to bless and grow the seeds of the gospel that were planted in their hearts that week. We pray also, Lord, for the middle school, for the RYM trip this week. We pray that you, Jesus, would draw students into deeper relationship with yourself through this trip, and that lasting spiritual fruit would come as a result. For those in our congregation who are sick, those in pain, those battling cancer, and other physical ailments, we ask, Lord, that you would bring healing to them and enable them to recover. You are the giver and restorer and sustainer of our lives. And therefore, we ask that you would give wisdom and insight to the doctors who are treating them and also strengthen their caretakers who are enduring these trials with them. We pray also, Lord, for our public servants, policemen, firemen, medical workers, uh, and those who serve in our military. We ask for your protection for their lives and for their families as they are often asked to personally sacrifice so much for the sake of a greater cause. Thank you for their service and for the blessing that they regularly provide us with. We pray also, Lord, for the missionaries who are raising support or experiencing setbacks, loneliness out on the field. Would you provide for their needs, both financially and emotionally, and refresh them? And by your spirit, show us what part you would have us play in your work of spreading the gospel of Jesus among the nations. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Russ this morning as he brings us your word through preaching. We ask that you would empower him by your Holy Spirit to rightly divide the word of truth, comforting those who need comforting and convicting those who need convicting. We long to hear from you, Lord. So speak to us now through your word and by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord calls us to stewardship, and 1 Chronicles 16, 29 says, Ascribe to the Lord, glory do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Two things to say here. Um, ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Um, what does it mean to ascribe glory to God? Well, we don't add to God's glory um, through our giving, right? Through our stewardship. Um, do we make God somehow more glorious by our giving? No. Rather, um, there's no deficiency in God. And so rather what happens is we make much of God's name. It's because he is worthy, because of who he is, that we, great, that we get to give back what he has given to us for everything that we have belongs to the Lord. And so now, um, as we give our tithes and offerings, we pray uh, that we would do it with joyful hearts um, in light of who God is, um, not to add anything to God, um, for he is glorious in and of himself. Um, and so now, um, ushers, would you please go forward and um, we'll worship the Lord through our giving. Oh, and children will be dismissed shortly after this, uh, after this song for Children's Church. Thank you.
Well, today the scripture is going to challenge us not to be a bunch of quarrelsome people. So I want to acknowledge to begin with, controversy is not always wrong. I don't think that's what the Apostle Paul intends to say this morning. You should argue for what is right in the face of somebody calling evil good or good evil. You should argue against what is wrong. You should argue for the truth. You should argue against falsehood to uphold the right to abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Those are, those are good and noble reasons to engage in a controversy. You should defend the innocent. You should strive to hold the guilty accountable. The, not all controversy is bad. But what the Apostle Paul will get at this morning is, in fact, addressing those of you, addressing me, when we have a passion for controversy, when we show a desire to engage in it, a delight in argument over foolish or ignorant or profitless things that reveals a, a spiritual childishness. You know how children do this when they argue over things that don't matter, and they argue in ways that are childish. Did not, did so, did not, did so, you're a doo-doo head. 
I am rubber, you are glue. What bounces off me sticks to you. You know, it's childish, and you as adults know it's childish, but you also as adults know, yeah, sometimes we don't do much better, do we? Sometimes we succumb to this type of of childish controversy. But if you are Christ's, then Paul says that you, no less than Timothy, are the Lord's servant. You are the Lord's servant. And as Paul teaches Timothy, the Lord's servant must refuse, just refuse to engage in foolish controversy. And so I'd invite you to open with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. This morning we'll be looking at verses 22 to 26. You can find that on page 996 in the black Bible that is in the pew in front of you. Page 996. And in this passage of Scripture, Paul contrasts controversy over against correction. Engaging in a disagreement for the purpose of or the aim of or in a spirit of controversy over against in a spirit of correction. And he teaches that gentle correction and not foolish controversy more often fosters repentance. That to use gentle correction rather than foolish controversy more often fosters repentance. And so as I read, I want you to listen for how correction and not controversy fosters repentance and how you therefore and I therefore must, must refuse foolish controversy. And it's with that in mind that I'll read now from 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. And as we read, let's remember that this is God's holy word. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now, beloved, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. So I want to, to recognize that it, is, that it is gentle correction and not controversy that best fosters repentance. And so you must, you must refuse foolish controversy. And I want you to set aside those two points in your bulletin. Just set them aside. I'm going to use different wording. You can scratch it out. I'll give you new wording. I think it better captures what's happening in the passage. And so you might ask, well, pastor, how? How do, I, how do I refuse or shun foolish controversy? And the first point is this, by shunning a passion for foolish controversy. By shunning a passion for foolish controversy. Look again at verse 22. Flee youthful passions. Flee youthful passions. Uh, Paul is not forbidding controversy per se, but a passion for it, and specifically about those things that are either uh, foolish or ignorant. And so he says, flee youthful passions. And then in verse 23, he says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies because you know that they breed quarrels. And he's talking about the same thing in both, in both verses. He's talking about the, one of the youthful passions we have, these strong passions that I'm supposed to flee and that you're supposed to flee is... Uh, a willingness to engage in, an eagerness even to engage in what he refers to as foolish and ignorant, ignorant controversies or quarrels. In verse 24, he refers to this as an attitude of quarrelsomeness, and the Lord's servant must not possess this attitude. That means, and, and you've experienced this before, everybody's had at least a day. Maybe you're the most shy, retiring, delightful person in the whole world, and you never get into arguments, but you know you've had a day where you've woken up ready to fight for whatever reason. You are itching for a fight. You make a mountain out of every molehill. You need to prove that you're right by proving that someone else is wrong. You have a passion to persuade 
that cannot allow a disagreement to abide, even if it's a disagreement over the most petty thing. So Paul tells Timothy, you need to flee this. Flee that passion, that itch to argue. And specifically to do so, he says about things that are foolish or ignorant controversies. Foolish is a moral category, right? We've talked about this before, that folly in the Bible is not, oh, that guy tripped over himself, what a fool. But folly is a moral category of a person who will not listen to the Lord or live according to the Lord's instructions. And the word that is used here that is translated foolish is the word from which we get our word moron. Avoid moronic controversies. These are things that, controversies that possess an immoral aim. So when we look at verse 25, we'll see that, that you see that correction best fosters repentance and that the goal for a godly man or woman in engaging in any argument, any conflict, if it's necessary even, but especially, wow, if it's unnecessary, is to pursue repentance which creates reconciliation, which fosters obedience. But here, if you're in a moronic quarrel, then you're pursuing an immoral aim or you're engaging in it in an immoral way. So avoid those foolish, flee from foolish controversies and from those that are ignorant. Ignorant, it's just what it means, untrained, unlearned, uneducated. It means that you have a lack of facts or a lack of information necessary to arrive at a biblical stand. And so you fight over matters of opinion or speculation. So, does the toilet paper roll go with the paper over the top or coming out underneath? Okay, yeah, see, everyone's got an opinion. Is it really worth arguing about? I mean, is, it, is there so much information available to you that you can arrive at a conclusion that precludes the conclusion of the person next to you such that you have to win? Well, if you're married, maybe. But, but these things don't profit, and that's what Paul is getting at, quarrels that don't profit. And so he's talking about this passion that speaks to your attitude, arguing without the right motive, uh, arguing not to edify but to argue, and then arguing over the wrong things, things that there's no real conclusion to, or you're arguing over things that are not morally pressing toward the right end, and both speak to this, and I think this is why he's getting at this with Timothy, is that this kind of behavior speaks to spiritual immaturity. It's, it's the presence of passion, but passion that hasn't been tempered by the will of Christ. It's a lack of moral growth, a lack of biblical humility. It's possessing zeal without knowledge, and the willingness to use that zeal to argue about every molehill in a way that ought to be reserved for arguing about mountains. And so what Paul is telling Timothy is, uh, I want you to pursue spiritual maturity because your immaturity will be demonstrated in a passion for foolish controversy. So shun the passion for foolish controversy. Shun it, refuse it, avoid it, flee it, flee that. So I would ask you, what is the stupidest argument you have ever had? I mean, just think back. Pause for a moment. Stupidest argument I've ever had. I went to a website where people listed the stupidest arguments they've ever had. These three are actually from the web. You, you can find them yourself. Uh, two, two women who were roommates argued over whether the toilet paper should go over the top or underneath, and they got into a verbal shouting mat that, match that led to three weeks of the silent treatment between the two of them. When they began to talk again, they got into an argument where one of them referred to the other at using a bad word for a prostitute. They got into a fist fight. They tackled. They went down onto the ground. One of them broke her wrist, went to the emergency room. They stopped living together over toilet paper. There was another, uh, a man and his girlfriend had the, this argument. If you put icing on a muffin, does it automatically become a cupcake? She said yes, he said no, and they broke up. <laughs> and maybe my personal favorite, they had an argument over uh, whether water in a lake is wetter than water in a swimming pool. 
Now, here's the thing. You laugh and I laugh, but who here could add to that list? Oh, you better raise your hand because you know that you have had just phenomenally silly arguments. So what Paul tells Timothy is flee, run away from stuff like that, shun it, avoid it, make it a point to get away from that. That desire in you, not just the actual engagement of the argument, but probe your own heart to see if you actually kind of maybe sometimes like that. And, and Paul says, shun it. It's a mark not just of immaturity in general, but it's a mark of spiritual immaturity in particular. Uh, many of you at some point along the way came to an understanding of Reformed theology or a Calvinist understanding of salvation, and then you became a jerk because you absolutely had to argue with everyone and you had to convince every single other person that your understanding of the Bible was the right one and they needed to, right? It's a mark of immaturity when people do that. And so Paul says, have nothing to do with, do not heed, reject these things. You must shun such controversies. It's a command. And so I would ask you, are you obeying? You are the Lord's servant, after all. You represent him. And the Lord's servant, verse 24 says, must not be quarrelsome. Well, how do we do, how do, we do this? How do you avoid this? How do you subdue this passion within yourself? Well, firstly, I would say cultivate maturity by pursuing everything in verse 22, right? Verse 22 said not only to flee youthful passions, but it said pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So the idea is uh, if all I do is kill a passion for foolish controversy, then there's nothing there. Nature abhors a vacuum. And so always we're to be putting aside those things which are unprofitable, putting aside those things which are immature, fleeing from those things which lead to quarrelsomeness. But we're also to be actively pursuing and chasing after those things that cultivate spiritual maturity. So it's not enough, it's not enough to say to your child when you correct your child, that's an immature way of behaving, don't do that. But what do you also need to say to them? And here's what it looks like when you're behaving in a mature way. Here's what it would look like if you were making choices according to being an adult. And so that's what, that's what Paul tells Timothy. He says, flee from these things, but also pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace. And when you do that, those, those increase your ability to discern when something is foolish and isn't worth your time to argue about, or when something is ignorant and there's no real reaching a biblical conclusion, so why am I arguing about it? it? It helps you to discern between controversy that is necessary and controversy that is foolish. And then, then confess your ignorance where your ignorance exists. Each of us can probably say in some way, shape, or form that Regarding 99% of what exists on the face of the earth, I have no knowledge. And especially the more educated you become in one narrow area, the more ignorant you become in all the others. Everything I know about most of the world can fit into a thimble. So what am I arguing about? But social media makes you think that because you read an article on Facebook, you're now an expert. And what do experts like to do? Assert their expertise. And so you assert your expertise. But the person you're asserting your expertise with also read an article on Facebook that was different than the one you read, and they want to assert their expertise, and now you've got two experts who start going at it like this, neither of whom know much of anything. But believers, we should be humble, shouldn't we? And confess those things that we don't know. And it leads to the ability to do this, to allow opinions to vary to allow somebody to think something that you don't think or, or come to a different conclusion than you do, to recognize that some things are unclear. So, for example, there are many views about the particular events that will transpire in and before and during the return of Christ. There's a lot of different views, as a matter of fact. Everybody recognizes this. Jesus comes back and he wins. <laughs> but all these little pieces in between... Could it be that a, a posture of humility would say, well, maybe, there's, maybe the reason why there's so many views is that the biblical information isn't extensive enough for us to chart out in detail exactly what's going to happen. So ask the Holy Spirit um, not to be baited into quarreling. 
especially baited into quarreling online. After all, uh, one of the fruit of the Spirit that we read about earlier is what? Love, joy, peace, patience? Right? Patience? Um, it's not your job to fix every stupid opinion that you run across on social media. Uh, so shun controversy. Um, avoid it and then pursue those things that make for Christian maturity. Pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And as we return to the text, the, the Apostle Paul moves from, from telling Timothy, you need, to shun, you need to shun controversy, to talking to him about showing a faithful pattern of, of correction in the face of disagreement. Because I want you to remember that correction and not controversy best fosters repentance. And so you must, must refuse foolish controversy, not only by shunning a passion for foolish controversy, but, but secondly, by showing a passion for faithful correction. Show or demonstrate in your life a passion. You are passionate about something, but let it be a passion for faithful correction. Verse 24 says that the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. And Paul was writing this, and where was Paul? In prison, on death row. And so the everyones to whom he needed to be kind, including, included unbelieving guards who watched over him, including the people who put him where he was. And he talks of treating those folks with kindness. And kindness doesn't mean just being nice. And I got in trouble uh, a couple of months ago for saying in a sermon that uh, being nice and being Christian are not the same thing. And evidently, at least for one person, it came across as me saying, you don't need to be nice. I hope you know that's not what I was saying. It is important to be a kind person. But look at how Paul describes that kindness. Kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil and correcting his opponents with gentleness. So the kindness he has in mind is the ability to teach and the patient endurance of evil. That word patient describes tolerating difficult circumstances or difficult people without getting upset. I am much more patient with difficult circumstances than I am with difficult people. What about you? What Paul is talking about is remaining cool-headed or even-tempered when others are not because it's a mark of spiritual maturity. Again, love, joy, peace, patience. That ability to maintain a cool head when other people are losing it is a mark of spiritual maturity. Proverbs 17.27 says that whoever restrains his words has knowledge and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. It says in Proverbs 15, 18, that a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. And so, you know, Paul talks to you, and he talks to Timothy about correcting your opponents, correcting them even with gentleness, and, and maybe a more wooden translation would be teaching with meekness the hostile ones teaching with meekness those who are hostile. And you know that a gentle answer turns away wrath, and we've talked about this before, that meekness is the, the quality of not defending yourself. It's the quality of not asserting your rights. It's, it's the willingness even to be insulted, to lose the argument in order to win the man for Christ. That's, that's meekness. And why, why this attitude? Why is this cool-headedness and this, this meekness? Well, We'll look again at verse 25 and 26. He's correcting his opponents with gentleness, and God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You see, these opponents that Paul is talking to Timothy about, they are theological opponents, and they may very well even be brothers and sisters in Christ. They're in the church. Now, some of them are teachers and some of them are congregants. But what they share in common is this, that they have believed some form of falsehood. And they're arguing for that form of falsehood. And according to Jesus in John 8, who is the father of lies? Yeah, the devil is the father of lies. Every lie, whether it's a big, bold, obvious lie or a subtle, pernicious half-truth, 
comes from one source and one source alone. And so verse 26 says that they are captured by him to do his will without knowing it, often without knowing it, and often believing that they're serving God with a clean heart, they're actually teaching the teachings of a different father. And this is the, this is the frightening thing, and it ought to be humbling for you, and it is humbling for me. There is no heretic on earth who has ever believed he was a heretic. He believed it was right. He believed he was teaching the truth. He believed he was serving God. And these do as well. And many who think themselves to be about the business of God are actually about the business of a very different father. And they're engaging in controversy that is based on ignorance and that is full of foolishness, right? So they don't know the truth and they don't live according to it. And that makes sense because Jesus said in John 17, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctification comes through the truth. And if that's the case, then what comes through a lie? The opposite of sanctification. You cannot believe untruth, but that it begins to show through immoral conduct. Every time. And so what they're displaying is both having believed a lie, but the lie having done its work in their hearts such that now they're quarrelsome. Now they're foolish. Now they're engaging in ignorant controversies. Now they've given up gently correcting for the sake of repentance, but they're arguing for the sake of winning. You see, what they've believed has borne fruit in how they live, and Paul tells Timothy, that must not be you. It cannot be you. And so Paul stresses the goal of any controversy must be to establish the truth, correcting, right? If you correct something, you're correcting it to a standard. What's the standard? The Bible, right? That's the standard. So you correct to the standard, the Bible, inculcating truth in light of the Scripture, but also to bring about repentance because immoral or wrong beliefs lead to immoral conduct. And God will bring repentance through what? Well, through cool-headed, meek, correcting that seeks the good of an opponent rather than simply a desire to argue and to win. So you, in your controversies, and you're going to have them, and sometimes they're necessary, but in, in having them, cultivate a passion for faithful correction. So men, let me ask you, is that how you argue with your wife? Does it go like this? Um, uh, now, dear, let me gently correct you because when you say that mayonnaise belongs on french fries, I think you've been led astray by Satan. <laughs> I don't think so. I need to cultivate a passion for gentle correction. I need to cultivate meekness, which is a willingness to be wrong or wronged. I need to cultivate a striving for repentance. Well, how do, you, how do we do this practically? Uh, there's a few things. Practically, it begins with repentance. And I'll just be truthful and honest here. My wife has pointed out to me on a number of occasions my propensity to walk up to her, headbutt her with the log protruding from my eye in order to pull the speck out of hers. It begins with repentance. At some point along the way, you have to say, I am the quarrelsome man. I am the quarrelsome woman. This tempts me too, and sometimes... I fall prey to it. And you must acknowledge before God the damage that it does. Consider, consider Proverbs 20 and verse 3. It's an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife. But every fool will be quarreling. And therefore, Proverbs 29, 22 says, A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one who is given to anger causes much transgression. And so you have to turn away from it yourself in repentance before you can hope to correct others. And so I would urge you to go to God in a spirit of repentance and then pray also for an attitude shift toward fostering repentance and not toward seeking victory. Often we seek victory. I, I want to be right. You want to be right. We both want to be right. And when we both want to be right, mm. but Proverbs 13.10 says, by insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. So desire the best for others and seek to rescue them from their bondage as you would want to be rescued yourself. After all, if, if you had been taken captive by something that was false, 
Okay. Would you want to be argued with or set free? It's a simple, uh, a simple thing to apply this in, in terms of, well, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So repent. Pray for an attitude shift in yourself. Pray for a taming of your own tongue. You know that your tongue is, is as James says, a restless evil. How do you use your tongue? It can wound or it can heal. Uh, consider Proverbs 25, 11, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. What a beautiful thing a word fitly spoken. How is it that you use your tongue in an argument? What is it seeking? Is it seeking the best of the other person, or is it seeking to win? Uh, I would ask you to pray to God to use your gentle correcting to bring about repentance. Repentance is always a gift of God's grace. It's always a gift. But you can be the instrument through which that gift comes. That's the beautiful thing. We we each get the possibility of being the instrument through which that gift comes. So ask, ask that he would use you as an instrument of repentance and reconciliation and not as an instrument of quarreling. I think sometimes we have not because we ask not. And I would ask you to ask the Lord to increase your compassion for those who are deceived, that you might act in a spirit of gentleness. One of the things I have to remind myself, especially if I'm talking with somebody who theologically is not on the same page that I am, or maybe even has been deceived and led away by a cult or a sect, I just remind myself over and over, this is the phrase that comes back, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. If, they, if, if it ultimately ends and I'm, they think I'm wrong, it's not about me. If ultimately they say something mean to me, I can't take it personally, it's not about me. Really, I want this conversation to be about helping somebody who has been captured. They have been snared by the devil to do his will, and I want to care enough about them to recognize they have been lied to, they have been deceived, and they are acting out of their deceit. So, ask for the heart of, of Christ because he always had harsh words for religious leaders, didn't he? For those who should have known better and were oppressing the sheep. For those who shouldn't be, should have been shepherds, but they acted more like wolves. He had really hard words. But to the sheep who had been deceived, oh, he was, he was gentle, wasn't he? Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that ought to be the posture of our heart toward those who have been deceived. And then, and then, beloved, last of all, it could be first of all, know the Word. Because the Word takes ignorance and it turns it into knowledge of the truth. It is through the Word that you are sanctified. And Christ digs out that quarrelsomeness and He replaces it with gentle correction. It's through the Word that you mature both in your understanding of the Word and your living out of it. Without this, you are in no position, you're in no position to discern what's going on in another person. Without this, then you're subject to being deceived yourself rather than correcting somebody who's been deceived. Without this, it's so much more difficult to discern when somebody is a wolf in sheep's clothing or a sheep that is acting temporarily like a wolf. Know the Word, read the Word, study the Word, pray over the Word, because it's the Word that ultimately will equip you and ultimately through which Christ Himself will sanctify you, leading you to flee quarrelsomeness and to pursue those things that make for Christian maturity. So, beloved, you also are the Lord's servant, no less than Timothy, no less than me. You are the Lord's servant, and I would simply ask you this, does it show does it show in the way that you speak with other people? Does it show in the way that you disagree without being disagreeable? Correction, not controversy, best fosters repentance. And so do not quarrel over foolish things. Do not quarrel over ignorant things. These simply show your Im spiritual immaturity. Flee these and pursue maturity in Christ. And correct gently with meekness because it is it is through such correction that God often grants repentance. And you know this, that repentance restores fellowship around the truth. 
So strive to demonstrate a passion, yes, a passion. Not for quarrels, but for correction that draws others closer and closer and closer to Christ. Will you pray with me? Our gracious God and Father, we come to you convicted by your word because we know that there is a seed of quarrelsomeness in each of us. But the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. So, Father, we ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would grant us a deep love and compassion for those who have been deceived. We pray that you would teach us with the Scripture and guard us from deception, that you would cause us to be mature in Christ Jesus, and that we would have a passion for gently correcting those who have gone astray recognizing that they have been captured. Give us discernment. Give us the heart of Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Please stand with me as we close by singing together, Oh, How Good It Is. It's on page 8 in your bulletin. Before you depart with the Lord's blessing, I need to correct a mistake I made earlier in the service. I told you that the Golden Oaks lunch was going to be in the upstairs fellowship hall. It won't be. It's going to be in the downstairs reception hall. So if you want to find it, go this way, exit that door, and go downstairs. I apologize to the Golden Oaks. 
And now go trusting in the Lord, seeking his face, that you might be one who corrects gently and brings about repentance and go with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.